so we will have two breaks during the presentations for questions and the presenters will announce when these times are available. Um, and if you're interested in asking questions or making comments, um, you may do so during the presentation by using the question box on your control panel. If you just type a message, um, I will end up reading the question to our speakers and then you'll get a response at the end of the presentation. And if we can't get to all the questions, um, which, which may be the case, we'll just make sure that you get an answer um, after the presentation. So um, the recording is going to be archived on a National Park Service website and you'll receive a link in your inbox following the webinar. But if you are um, outside of the National Park Service, please email me and to obtain a recording of the webinar. Um, and some of my email address is just jen, J-E-N underscore Williams at nps.gov. Again, that's jen underscore Williams at nps.gov. So today's webinar is going to feature um, Elka Wind and David Pilliad. Elka Wind is a self-employed contract biologist and she lives and works in Vancouver Island, British Columbia. In 1996, she received her Master of Science from the University of British Columbia. The focus of her work has been habitat management as it pertains to amphibian species, including wetland restoration and construction. However, she's also been involved in numerous impact assessment projects associated with forestry, mining, renewable energy projects, and pipelines. Her current research is focused on western toad winter hibernation in a populated area of southeastern Vancouver Island. Ms. Wind has been a member of the Society for Northwestern Vertebrate Biology for almost 15 years, and she served on the board between 1998 and 2010. She was also co-chair for the Northwest Chapter of Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, and her other volunteer work includes being a former leader for Nature Kids BC. David Pilliad is a research ecologist at the USGS Forest and Rangeland Ecosystem Science Center in Boise, Idaho. David's research focuses on ecology and conservation biology of aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. David has worked with amphibians and reptiles in the Northwest for over 20 years. He is particularly interested in working with agencies to improve monitoring data and use those data to answer questions regarding the effectiveness of resource management and restoration. David received his BA from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and his PhD from Idaho State University. Um, just to let you know that, the, again, this is part of a webinar series, so there will be three more webinars focusing on um, habitat management guidelines and restoration and recovery of amphibians and reptiles. And the purpose is to assist natural resource managers with the amphibian and reptile conservation. So the other three regions covered will include the Midwest, Northeastern U.S., and Southeastern U.S. Um, and I will send out the announcement for the next webinar, but the next one's going to cover the Midwest, and it will be delivered by Bruce Kingsbury and Joanna Gibson, and it will occur on Thursday, April 14th at 1 p.m. So without further ado, um, we will um, have David and Elka take it over. Thank you again. Great. Thanks very much, Jen. Just making sure that everything is working here. I uh, can't get the screen to advance. Uh, any suggestions? I'm hitting page down. Try to exit the slides and show and start from the beginning. Uh, Sorry, sorry, Jamie, can you go oh, exit the slideshow? I think just hit escape and then go down to the start presentation. Okay. Do you, did it work? It did, but um, Jamie, I'm still seeing the navigation panel on Elka's slides. Are you Okay, hit well? that orange arrow up on the top from the control panel and then it'll slide it over. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Well, good. Great. Thank you. Um, on behalf of PARC, uh, Jen, David, and myself would like to take this opportunity to thank the Wildlife Conservation Branch and Biological Resources Division within the National Park Service for funding this webinar series. 
which is the increasing awareness of amphibians and reptiles and their conservation needs. The webinar today will be broken down into four main sections. Uh, we'll start with a brief introduction to PARC, and that's PARC with a C, so hopefully that's not going to be too confusing for National Park staff. And then I'll be giving an introduction and overview of the biology and the ecology of amphibians and reptiles for those who may not be too familiar with this group. Then David is going to take over and he's going to introduce the habitat management guidelines for the Northwest and go through some example habitats and associated case studies. And then lastly, I'll just be briefly touching on um, legislation around herpetofauna. So what is PARC? Uh, Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. We're a diverse group of people that discuss herp conservation at the local, regional, national, and international level. PARC is an inclusive advocate of herp conservation, and we provide a resource for anyone interested in herps and their habitat. So it's a diverse group of people that includes representatives from all of the federal and state agencies, as well as representatives from hundreds of NGOs, colleges, and zoos, etc. There's no membership free fee, and anyone can join PARC. PARC consists of five regions, and there are seven state chapters, as you can see here. You can see on the map here that in uh, purple on the, on the west side there, the northwest region of PARC is um, what we're going to be talking about today. It's a very large area. It stretches from Alaska down to northern California and across to um, Montana and Wyoming. And the mission of PARC is to conserve amphibians, reptiles, and their habitats as integral parts of our ecosystem and culture through proactive and coordinated public-private partnerships. PARC is useful for any land managers, biologists, and consultants who, um, and we have numerous resources and useful tools to help you in your goal of managing and protecting herps. For example, PARC developed a guiding document for agencies or groups interested in identifying um, priority herp conservation areas. And, and we've, David and I have compiled a handout that you'll have access to um, through the talk that contains um, some of the resources and tools that you can access at PARC as well as other um, information. For those of you who may not be very familiar with amphibians and reptiles, I'm just going to uh, quickly go through some basic biology and life history. The Northwest has a wide variety of amphibian and reptile species, and we have high rates of what is called endemism which refers to species that only occur within one specific area, so within our northwest region. Compared to other vertebrate groups, amphibians have lagged behind in terms of research, habitat management, and conservation. But in order to manage for or conserve a species, you need to have an understanding of where it lives, what it eats, how it behaves, and other areas of its life history. There are over 100 herp species within the northwest including frogs and toads, salamanders, turtles, lizards, and snakes. And a lot of diversity within this group of vertebrates, so it's important to get to know the species within your uh, specific area. Let's go through five of the main natural history factors that characterize amphibians and reptiles that you should be aware of from a management perspective. Number one, herps are ectotherms, or what um, is commonly referred to as cold-blooded. Um, and they may lie dormant when conditions are cold or dry. There are advantages and disadvantages to being an ectothermic vertebrate. It means you don't have soft, fluffy fur or brightly covered feathers that attract the eyes and hearts of humans, but it means you don't have to eat very much compared to warm-blooded or endothermic animals. Get their bodies to suitable temperature to keep everything functioning, like digesting their food, growth, etc. Amphibians and reptiles have to move into warm environments or outright bask in the sun. To avoid freezing, overheating, or drying out, amphibians and reptiles have to seek cover. Some will go dormant in the cold of winter or during the heat of summer. Number two, herps are often hidden and mostly solitary. But on occasions, they can be quite conspicuous and occur in large numbers. Again, there's advantages and disadvantages to this. Because they're often hidden under cover during the day, people don't see them, and they're often unaware of all of the herp species within their area, which can become a public awareness issue. 
The times when herps may draw attention are when they're congregating at breeding sites, so when we're hearing large numbers of chorusing frogs, or example, for example, gathering in and around hibernation sites. Um, snakes can uh, occur in thousands around hibernation areas. The somewhat secretive nature makes it challenging for scientists to study herps. And the places where these herps are hanging out during the day or when conditions aren't suitable, what we refer to as microsites, are important to their survival, but they can be very difficult to identify on the ground. Number three, herps use a variety of aquatic and terrestrial habitats during their lifetime, and some may move over several miles to reach them. As I mentioned earlier, there's a great diversity within herps, and this is an area where we see a lot of variability in terms of how far animals move and what habitats they occupy. Some species, like the western toad shown here, may move more than a mile between their aquatic breeding sites and hibernation sites, whereas other species may stay within a very small area, such as a, a small forest stand or even within one large log, within a single pond or lake, or within a rock outcrop for their entire lives, which can be a very long time given their body size. For example, tailed frogs can live up to 25 years. Number four. Sorry, I just wanted to go back one thing that I missed on this one. Uh, with those animals that are moving around between habitat types, um, it's easy to see how something like roads can become a major issue for migrating species, as well as the need to protect the travel routes that they're actually using to get to between these habitats. The challenge is that we often don't understand what those habitats are. For many species, we have little understanding of where they're hibernating on land, for example, in the winter. And this becomes an issue of scale as well, because we have to have an understanding of what herps need at a landscape and a microsite level. Number four, some species of amphibians may have widely fluctuating populations, usually in response to changes in climatic conditions. Some amphibians and reptiles have low reproductive output. They reach sexual maturity relatively late in life, and they produce relatively few offspring. In contrast, other species are explosive breeders. They produce thousands of young, but these young experience very low rates of survival. In this latter group, we have the herb species, uh, especially the amphibians, that breed in water. And the size of the population is closely linked to climatic conditions. In good uh, snow or rain years where temperatures are, are normal, lots of young might survive. But in drought years, relatively few survive. Because weather is highly variable, the population size of the species, um, the population sizes of these species also are highly variable. It's difficult to get a grasp of what the status is for that species, whether the population is increasing or decreasing. In order to figure this out, it takes long-term studies, which are costly and time-consuming. So for these species, we've tended to change our perspective on how we study this sort of thing. And we tend to focus on the presence of a species at a breeding site uh, or the number of occupied sites within a landscape versus the size of individual breeding populations. The big question here in terms of management is um, how these species are going to adapt to climate change. So can these species adapt to more frequent drought conditions? Number five, amphibians and reptiles play important roles as both predators and prey in functioning ecosystems. Oops, sorry. So why do we care about conserving amphibians and reptiles? Among other things, amphibians um, are food for many species. And in some landscapes, they can represent a very high amount of biomass for um, a vertebrate group. They help to control a lot of what we humans refer to as pest species. So they'll eat a lot of uh, mice and rats and mosquitoes. And lastly, aquatic breeding herp species are like salmon that hatch in streams and go out to sea. Aquatic breeding herps tr transfer nutrients between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. The tadpole frogs are eating algae and plant matter within the wetland. And then when they transform and move on to land, they make those wetland nutrients available to a suite of terrestrial species that eat them. So 
at this point, we're going to open it up to any questions while we transfer the talk over to David. And then he's going to go on and talk about the habitat management guidelines. Are there any questions around park itself or that brief introduction to the life history of Hertz? I, um, this is Jen Elka. I actually don't see any questions in the questions box, nor do I see any um, hands raised in the attendees panel. So um, we can give it another few seconds, but then head on to the next section. Perfect. I think we can move on. OK, moving on. My name is David Pilliad, and uh, I'm going to give an overview of the Habitat Management Guidelines book itself. And this guidelines was intended to provide private landowners and state federal resource agency folks um, and other interested stakeholders with regional information on the habitat associations and requirements of amphibians and reptiles. And as Elka mentioned, this, this area extends um, across several states in the, in the western U.S. and then up into Canada and, and Alaska. And this is an ecoregional boundary that we were using, and there's quite a bit of overlap between these uh, regions. Um, so this allows for um, moving beyond state and political boundaries and considering the ecological systems as a whole. When applied on the ground, the habitat management guidelines um, are really intended to promote conservation of amphibians and reptiles. And we do this by uh, several principles. One, keeping common species common. So this is not just focused on threatened and endangered species. Stemming the decline of imperiled species. Guiding the restoration of amphibian and reptile habitats while benefiting many other species and ecological processes and functions and reducing the likelihood that additional species will be added to the endangered species list. So we start out the book with what we call conservation challenges, uh, the most important of which is habitat degradation and loss. And this is not news to most scientists and, and biologists, but this is really our greatest conservation challenge. More than a third of amphibians and reptiles are threatened with extinction and the, the number one cause is usually associated with this habitat loss or fragmentation, degradation. And the pictures uh, here show development in urban and rural areas, but uh, we also consider uh, areas like the bottom right where you have vast areas that have been converted to agriculture or been bisected by roads and other activities. And some of this may not be relevant to a National Park Service unit, but certainly road construction and road maintenance, bridge maintenance, um, park service housing and staffing uh, facilities, all of that um, certainly has linkages to park service activities. Other conservation challenges that we talk about in the, in the book is the habitat conversion I mentioned, uh, also these linear features like dirt roads and trails, major roads and highways, surface and groundwater use, uh, chemicals associated with agriculture, and that includes nutrient inputs from livestock. Livestock grazing itself, or the removal of above-ground biomass and trampling. Uh, timber harvesting, mining, oil and gas exploration and development. Uh, some of that not in the parks, but maybe adjacent to the parks. Uh, fire and fuels management. Exploitation, this is another term for removal of animals or Sometimes we call it poaching. Non-native and invasive species. Subsidized and facilitated predators. This idea of, of meso predators that are associated with, um, say, you know, garbage cans and, and things that uh, places where animals uh, are subsidized by humans and then then have impacts on amphibians and reptiles. You can see those cats in the corner, for example. Um, disease, and there's several diseases that we, we think about with amphibians and reptiles, and then climate change. So we asked the National Park Service staff in a, in a not an official survey, but just an informal uh, 
series of emails about what they wanted to know about herps, and these were the lists that we compiled. Um, disease, particularly this new salamander fungus, the bee sal. Uh, poaching, federal and state listed herp species. Herbicides, how to improve and restore wetlands, particularly relevant to climate change. Uh, how to stop introductions and, and control, control non-native species. And then monitoring and inventory techniques, uh, particularly new ones like environmental DNA. So we don't have time in this presentation to go over all of these, but we did provide a handout uh, that you can download from the website afterwards. Um, and it, we provide resources that are available on each of these topics. And we're happy to answer questions as well. So the, the, the meat, really, of the habitat management guidelines focuses on habitat. And we broke this into two types. The first is called maximizing compatibility, and the other is ideal. What we mean by maximizing compatibility are guidelines for landowners or managers who wish to contribute to the conservation and stewardship of these animals, but while managing their land primarily for other uses. And this is activities like timber production, grazing, agriculture, recreation, as well as residential and industrial development. Ideal is more uh, for landowners and managers who want to, mac to make amphibian and reptile conservation the primary objective, such as nature preserves or wildlife refuges, private or agency lands, where optimizing the diversity and abundance of propetafauna is desired. And I think both of these activities occur on National Park Service lands, and, and often uh, there are kind of conflicting priorities or goals for both maximizing compatibility and ideal management. And I'll just give you a couple examples. The first is fuels management. So you can think of uh, a fuels management activity of removing um, above ground trees or shrubs, and this could reduce uh, the input of downed woody debris. Uh, it could reduce shading, so potentially increasing solar radiation and temperature. And for a short term, at least during the activity, it could increase ground disturbance. All of these activities may have negative effects on amphibians or reptiles. But there are long-term objectives of those activities, particularly with fuel reduction as reducing high severity fire, which may ultimately have some benefit to amphibians and reptiles. So this is an example of the conflicting priorities that we often face. Another example, if eradicating non-native species, um, there may be disturbance to habitat from uh, spraying or removing of plants, for example. Or there may be direct mortality of some life stages because of chemical applications. You can think of herbicides or maybe even uh, removing of uh, an aquatic species like an invasive fish. You may use antimycin or rotenone, something like that, which could kill an entire cohort of, say, a larval amphibian. Um, but ultimately, these activities could improve habitat quality if, if what's being removed is, a, is degrading the habitat quality or actually causing mortality of amphibians because of predation. Uh, the long-term goal would be to increase populations of amphibians and reptiles. And then finally, cattle grazing or watering. Um, you can think of uh, activities that could increase mortality from trampling or decreased uh, water quality because of of inputs of nutrients into the water. Um, but there's also evidence that uh, some of these activities may provide uh, water sources that are important for amphibian breeding or just hydration, in, uh, particularly in arid environments. Um, and also the grazing itself can open up habitats, whether aquatic habitats or riparian habitats. And this could provide critical habitat for basking or other life history needs. So what we did in the habitat uh, management guidelines is identify habitats that uh, fell into two groups, terrestrial and aquatic. And this is the list of all the habitats that were identified in the Northwest. Uh, obviously, it's not a complete list, and so we had to do some grouping. But what I've identified here are in bold the ones that we're going to cover in this presentation today. We don't have time to cover them all. But you can see the, the range of topics that are available in the, in the book itself. And, you can look at those in more detail on your own. The other uh, critical part to this is linking those habitats to the species themselves. So in Appendix B of the HMG, we have a species by habitat uh, matrix. And what is listed in blue, I mean, sorry, blue, in green up here are the, all the habitats that I just mentioned. And then 
in the species matrix, we have S for uh, suitable, P is preferred, and M is marginal. So it gives some relative importance of that habitat to each species. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but we also provide the state and uh, federal la uh, rank for these species as well. Of course, that's always changing, and some of it may get out of date, but um, that was current as of 2008. Okay, so I'm just going to jump into each habitat that I had in bold, and yeah. we'll start with the terrestrial ones and then take a break, and then we will talk about the aquatic habitats. And at the end of each of these, um, I have a case study that um, is, is uh, focused on a national park. So for dry coniferous forests, in a, in a maximizing compatibility capacity, and just to remind you, this is to contribute to the conservation and stewardship of these animals while managing for some other use. Um, so an example would be conduct prescribed fire activities late in the fall after first frost. The reason that for this is that uh, the, the prescribed fire can remove a lot of uh, biomass on the ground and co potentially cause mortality. Um, if you do it in the fall, you, you're doing it when the animals are less active, potentially have already moved into hibernacula, um, and so that it, it could be a, a, a benefit to the animals. But some animals uh, overwinter just under the leaf litter and those, or, or in wood, and so you could see that there are potential for mortality even if you do a prescribed fire late in the fall. During fuel reduction activities such as thinning and prescribed burning, retain some downed wood within stands. Downed wood is important for uh, many of these animals. Prescriptively graze stock among pastures or grazing allotments to avoid leaving inadequate vegetative cover in forest lands. The, uh, the grazing uh, height uh, recommendations that are often made, we don't know a lot about uh, what exactly is the, the the perfect guideline, but um, certainly some understanding of that is needed. And minimizing logging on steep slopes just to avoid erosion. Some of these are uh, logical for other reasons as well. Under an ideal management scenario, for example, uh, making amphibian and reptile conservation the primary objective, this might be true in a refuge or a park, uh, during fuel treatments retain some unburned or unthinned areas to provide refugia. Identify likely corridors among habitat features. And these habitat features could be things like ponds for breeding or seeps, rock outcrops. And maintain connectivity by minimizing activities in these areas. Restore natural fire regimes using prescribed fire at the historic fire return interval and during the natural fire season. This is <laughs> obviously has many challenges given the risk of escape and closely manage livestock around forest ponds, riparian forests, and streams. Continuing on this topic of ideal management, retain large trees and conserve snags for future recruitment of downed wood. Maintain natural wetland habitats and nearby uplands through the use of buffers. And now allow natural beaver activity where possible or consider reintroducing beaver where they have been lost. This is a, an area that has shown a lot of interest lately, particularly in the arid land regions of uh, using beaver to restore uh, wetland hydrology and habitat. Attempt to replant, preferably with native species, and reduce erosion in disturbed areas, especially around skidding and landing zones. So in dry coniferous forests, we identify the species that could benefit from these maximizing compatibility and ideal management actions. And we don't want to go over each of these species, but we do provide this list just to impress you of the number of species that we might need to consider uh, in, in our setting. And um, there are, as I mentioned, this, these species habitat matrices that can be useful, and um, there's also local information for, for states as well. So let me give you an example of, um, this is actually a research study, but it it has relevance to habitat management. So this is in Glacier National Park. There's a series of fires that uh, burned through the park. And the goal of the study was to understand why toads use burned and other disturbed areas of the park. So the boreal toad, Bufo boreus or Anosiris boreus, um, is often seen out in these burned forests. And so uh, a series of biologists from USGS and the University of Montana put transmitters on the toads and they 
followed them in these areas around Lake McDonald, which is um, near the entrance of Glacier National Park. In this brown area, you can see is, is a, a severely burned part of the fire. This lighter tan color is partially burned, and then these little uh, yellowish are in pockets of unburned habitat. And so this is just an example of telemetered toads occurring, and if you draw a perimeter around them, which is their normal activity area, um, you can see some animals are, are occupying areas of high severity, some are occupying areas of mixed, and some of uh, more partially burned or unburned habitat. And if you look at the, uh, the use by telemetered toads, just focus on the light bars up here, you can see that the proportion of use in unburned, low to moderate severity or high severity, the highest severity had the highest use more than expected um, by random. And so there is some indication here that toads are preferring these highly burned areas. So there's some effort to figure out why this might be. And ideally you'd put some kind of a, a uh, transmitter on animals and follow them into these different habitats like out in the open surface within vegetation, under a log, or in an open burrow, but toads don't just behave the way you want them to. So instead of doing that, what they did was they used biophysical models. So these are a small model here with a temperature trans, uh, uh, recorder that's placed inside, and they've done studies of real toads comparing them to these copper tubes that are painted with a, a mater uh, paint that's very much uh, resembling the reflectance patterns and absorption patterns of a real toad. And they found that they are a, a very good model for that. So you can put these wet and dry models either under a log or in a burrow, um, open surface or within vegetation, and look at how the toad's uh, temperature is responding to these different environmental conditions. And they did this in three locations. The high severity, which is the solid lines in these figures. The low severity, which is the dotted lines. And then the unburned patches, which are these dashed lines. And they looked at over a 24-hour period, so that's what's indicated here on the x-axis, how much time is the animal within its preferred body temperature under these different um, burn severity scenarios. So this yellow portion is the area of uh, optimal preferred body temperature for toads. And so you can see it's about 18 degrees up to 28 degrees is the preferred body temperature of the animal. And what you see here is time. So this animal in the open surface in the high severity has more time throughout a 24-hour period in, at its optimal temperature, more so than in the partially burned or the unburned. So this would be a, a particularly you know, open severity where all the canopy is lost. If there's still vegetation retained, you still get some benefit, although it's a little bit between high severity and low severity. Under a log, you actually get in the high six severity, you get up into that temperature where you don't in the uh, in the unburned case, and the same within the burrow. So there is some indication that these animals, even if they have to be in a burrow or under a log in a high severity area, they're able to maintain a body temperature that's more preferable. And you might say, who cares? Well, body temperature is very important for these ectothermic animals, as Elko was mentioning. And so one example is these uh, animals need to raise their body temperature to that preferred temperature for digestion, for, for shedding, and for shedding uh, diseases like the chytrid uh, fungus. Okay, moving on. The alpine and subalpine area was an important habitat we identified for parks because of the tendency for a lot of parks to have this type of environment. Um, under a maximizing compatibility, we recommend maintaining recreational fisheries in only the very largest lakes, most accessible to trails. In this way, we'd be able to provide fishing opportunities, but also provide habitats that are in a fishless state um, for, for amphibians or garter snakes, other, other uh, herpetofauna. Keep pack stock away from lakes, ponds, and streams. Highline pack stock and pack in weed-free hay or pellets. Where possible, eliminate or closely manage livestock to avoid grazing practices that leave inadequate vegetative cover on forest lands. In an ideal situation, it may be necessary to remove non-native fishes from lakes and streams, and some national parks have already started this process. 
to restrict camping or fishing to designated areas, particularly you know, following regulations of being a certain distance away from the edge of lakes and streams, and to implement a permit system for overnight stays so that lakes don't get so crowded or alpine areas don't get so crowded that there's damage to vegetation or trampling along the edge of, of lakes and streams. Furthermore, allow wildland fires to restore natural fire regimes by not suppressing lightning-caused fires when possible. And to build livestock exposures around some alpine forest ponds and control their access in riparian forests along streams. So again, I want to um, just touch on the, the species that could benefit from these high elevation areas. And you'd think, well, gee, you know, it's so cold <laughs> in these northern latitudes and and high altitudes, how could these ectothermic animals persist? But you can see this list is quite impressive. Um, what you see mostly drop out are the snakes, with the one exception, garter snakes. So there's quite a few garter snakes that occur at high elevations, but you don't pick up many of the other snake species or lizard species. So the case study for this comes out of Yosemite National Park, and there's been quite a lot of work over the last 20 years looking at this idea of pack stock and how to manage pack stock, what are the imp Im impacts of letting pack stock graze in alpine meadows, um, at, particularly at night or, or when um, they need this roughage or forage. And so the goal of this study was to examine the influence of pack stock use in high elevation meadows on Yosemite toad breeding, this is an endemic species to the high Sierras. And the actions could be potential fencing or grazing restrictions. Um, not implemented, but there's been talk of doing that to protect the Yosemite toad. And so on the map on the right, what we have are, in red, are Yosemite toad breeding locations. And blue are places where the toad was not observed breeding. This is across 1,150 meadows in this area of Yosemite National Park. The, the brown circles here are indicating where pack stock use uh, was present. And so you can see it's not across the entire range of the species, but it does overlap um, quite a bit in some areas. So they used a modeling approach to look at two variables. And you can imagine that evaluating pack stock effects on meadows is hard enough. But when you're trying to identify the effects on, a, on amphibian species, it can be even harder. So they found two that were not correlated together, but um, were representative of pack stock use. The first is average yearly pack stock nights per hectare. And they related that to the, the presence of Yosemite toad breeding. And the relationship between those two variables had an R of 0.045. So only 4.5% of the variation in Yosemite toad breeding could be explained by average yearly pack stock nights per hectare. And this is the, the distribution of, of, of modeled uh, probabilities across that range. And you can see that actually the R squared is slightly positive here. Um, it's not significant, but it is slightly positive, meaning there's a slight positive relationship between toad breeding and pack stock nights per hectare. Uh, it's not a negative effect. They looked at another variable, which was maximum yearly pack stock nights, so adding it up across the whole year, kind of a more duration effect. And again, they did not find a significant relationship. And only 5.1% of the variation was even explained by that variable. So you'd say, well, gee, these aren't very convincing models. Well, neither showed an effect, a negative effect. Um, and uh, it just also exemplifies the, the, the difficulty of assessing things like pack stock use um, in these alpine and subalpine meadows in the Sierras. OK, the last of the terrestrial systems I'm going to talk about before we take a break is rock outcrops, talus cliffs, and caves. And you might think, well, that's an interesting habitat. It's so focused. But it turns out that these habitat features are very important for reptiles so and, and amphibians as well, particularly the plethodontid amphibians of the lungless salamanders. So under maximizing compatibility, uh, we recommend be aware of the distribution of rare species so that development and resource extraction projects can avoid areas where they occur. Maintain vegetation for shading around rock outcrops and talus used by amphibians. Focus development projects impacts in areas where these rock outcrop features are common rather than where they are rare. 
and locate intensive disturbance away from rock features. Limit off-highway vehicles to areas well away from biologically significant sites, such as rattlesnake dens. And limit hard rock mining and quarry development in the vicinity of overwintering or birthing sites used by snakes. In an ideal situation, it might involve reducing or eliminating disturbance to rock outcrops and other rock substrates, so just halting any kind of disturbance. Identify and manage key talus habitats, such as snake dens and moist areas occupied by salamanders, and minimize publicity of where they are located to avoid collection and also just people's curiosity in turning rocks and searching for them. Maintain a buffer of vegetation around outcrops occupied by salamanders to maintain temperature and moisture regimes. This is a picture on the right of a snake den. This is a rattlesnake den in Idaho. Remove invasive plant species and use fire management to maintain sun exposed rock outcrop areas for reptiles. Maintain hydrological regimes and restrict or manage recreational access to rock outcrops, cliffs, and talus sites to minimize disturbance to vegetation covering talus and the structure of the talus itself. So this is our laundry list of species that benefit uh, from these rock outcrops, talus, cliffs, and caves. You can see that most of these are the plethodonid salamanders or, um, or snake species. There is uh, Red-legged frog and foothill yellow-legged frog uh, can be associated with, with some of these rock features. Okay, so the case studies, I have, I have several here, and I picked a couple because this is a, another difficult topic. Um, we wish we had, you know, concrete recommendations with, that are backed up by science, but unfortunately a lot of the science hasn't been done yet, or is just very difficult to do. Um, so here's a case study from Mount, oh, it's not Mount Rainier, it's Mount Rainier National Park. Um, the goal of this project was to assess potential impacts of roads um, and associated with that poaching and rock churning by herpers on amphibians and reptiles. And this was part of a broader uh, project by USGS and the National Park Service to just assess amphibian um, in general in, in the park. The action could be to potentially limit excavation or rock removal uh, road or campsite construction or chemical applications within occupied or potential habitats. And again, the species that they were focusing on in this case were the plethodonid salamanders, but also garter snakes and other species that are dependent on these features. And the picture on the right shows the habitat for larch mountain salamander and Van Dyke salamander in Mount Rainier National Park. And uh, this is coming out of a report that was published in 2013. One of these uh, uh, concerns is like the road is so close not only do you have potential for road mortality but you have potential for um, any kind of disturbance if if the road needs to be maintained widened the ditches have to be maintained and so forth another example comes not from a national park but from uh, just a roadside cut on highway 20 in southeastern Idaho this is um, up near Her Harriman State Park, so there is a park nearby, and there was some work being done in 2000 uh, to widen the road, and so they had to cut back, bl both blast and cut back on this embankment, and they found uh, hundreds and hundreds of garter snakes coming out of this embankment. So they halted construction, and they contacted Chuck Peterson at Idaho State University uh, about what to do, and he came up and he said, you know what, you should, you should stop, let the snakes leave the hibernacula and um, and then come come back at the peak of summer, do your work, and then hopefully in the fall when the animals come back to their hibernacula, they'll, they'll find the crevices they need and go back in. So that was the recommendation. Um, unfortunately, the, the uh, contract got delayed and they, they weren't able to get back in there until late fall of 2000 and they went ahead with the project um, and Chuck Peterson brought a crew up in the April of 2001, so this is them doing some survey work, didn't find any snakes at all. Um, he went back multiple times over the next 15 years and never saw any snakes in that area. 
including at times when they should be emerging from the hibernacula. So it seemed like that delay in the contract potentially either sealed the snakes in or killed them all during the blasting, which is a sad story. Um, he has since, in 2015, seen the first snakes, and he thinks that perhaps they were either there all along just at very low densities, a few survivors, and now they're starting to rebound, or maybe some new individuals have recolonized the site. Um, the one thing that is interesting is that common garter snakes, which used to be quite common in that area, seem to have just disappeared altogether, and all he's catching now are western terrestrial garter snakes. But kind of a sad story, but also a bit of a positive one that after 15 years, um, you can see that you know the shrubs are starting to come in. Instead of it just being gravel during the construction site, you have grasses here, and it may be just becoming more habitable to these animals. And then finally, I'm going to give an example of a, of a case study from Idaho National Laboratory in southeastern Idaho. Um, this is where uh, looking at roadkill along um, a pr fairly protected area in the National Laboratory um, perimeter. And Denham Yakumson did her master's thesis looking at snake kills along the road, which is a really common occurrence in national parks in general. And so this just shows you the number of snakes that were found dead in white or alive in gray bars for these different species. Um, incredible numbers of snakes, most of them dead. Um, and one, one of her analyses I thought was quite informative. She found that the presence of basalt piles within 100 meters of the roadside influences where snakes cross roads, most likely because of their dependence on these features. She also said, however, it may be difficult to estimate high-risk areas for snake road mortality without measuring parameters at both small and large scales, basically saying it's very complicated to identify uh, road crossing areas, but um, something that we need to learn more about because these road kills are probably having major impacts on populations. Okay, that concludes our terrestrial section. We have um, one final section which is on aquatic habitats, but we will take a moment here and let people ask questions. Hey David, this is Jen. I was wondering if, um, whenever you, if you could jump back to the, um, whenever you're talking about the alpine and subalpine areas, and if you could give folks just like a quick laundry list of, um, you know, the animals you're referencing when you um, cover pack stock, and then you also mentioned something about highlining the animals. I wasn't sure what you meant by the that one bullet point. Okay. You said like highline pack stock, something like that. I think it was your very first case study. Nope, I'm gonna have to do another one. Is there any other questions? Okay, so can you see that? Um, Move forward. Yeah, it says Alpine. Okay, okay, right here it says Highline Packs. Oops, oh, you you were on the right slide. I was. Right there, highline pack stock and pack and weed free hay or pellets. What do you mean by that? So, a highline is um, instead of tying animals to a tree, uh, what you can do is set up a, a, a taut line between two trees um, and then you tie the stock to that line so that they are away from the base of the tree and they do less damage to the roots. And um, that's the main, and you can move them around a little bit better. So you're not depending on the trees, for example, to tie them to. Um, you can set up these high lines and then tie to that line. And then the packing the weed-free hay or pellets, that's the idea of um, providing an alternate food source for, for pack stock um, instead of letting them graze on these sensitive meadow habitats. Um, my interaction with folks that bring mules and sometimes llamas and goats is that that's just that that hay and pellets is inadequate and they need them to graze in these open meadows um, so there is a bit of push and pull on that topic but um, that's what the recommendation is there and so when they're high lined that just prevents them from 
um, feeding on the meadow areas as well? It could. Yep, it could. It could concentrate them, and it also could mostly keep them away from the, the base of trees. Okay, and then we have another question that popped up. Um, uh, there's some folks are having trouble viewing the handout, and will this be available elsewhere? Um, yes, if you email me again, Jen at Jen uh, J E N underscore Williams at nps.gov, I'll be happy to get that handout to you. Sorry that it's not showing up um, in the handout section there. And are there any other questions before we move on to the next segment? No, it looks like we're all set to go. Okay, so I'll uh, move through these aquatic sections now. So for this first one, we're going to talk about riparian, which seems to be a, a topic that a lot of uh, folks are interested in. Um, for maximizing compatibility, we recommend consider applying a mix of riparian protective measures such as different buffer widths or consider connectivity of aquatic and terrestrial habitats in management plans. So the key word there is consider. <laughs> uh, carefully manage activities and ground disturbances in or near riparian areas. Avoid development activities such as road construction in riparian areas. Avoid the use of chemicals such as fertilizers, pesticides, and fire retardants in or near riparian areas. Reduce access to riparian areas that may facilitate the spread of invasive or non-native plants. And avoid orienting trails and roads parallel to riparian areas. And then under ideal management scenario, identify areas for protection or restoration priority. Provide aquatic riparian linkages via delineation of riparian buffers. And so you can see some riparian buffers here in this meadow habitat. There's this narrow ring of trees. That's what that's intended for. Provide some shading. Um, and you can see it's a little bit of a variable width where this side of it's thicker and this side of it's thinner. And then here's an example of something similar along a, a river. Maintain or restore large down wood interstitial spaces and substrates vegetation, temperature, and hydrological patterns. Replace culverts that fail to provide adequate aquatic organism passage, such as perched culverts. That's those that are hanging, and then the water just drops out of it like a waterfall, because animals can't pass through those. Remove invasive plant species and use fire management to maintain sun-exposed rock outcrop areas for reptiles. Maintain hydrological regimes and restrict or manage recreational access to rock outcrops, cliffs, talus, and talus sites to minimize disturbance to vegetation covering talus and the structure of the talus itself. So this has to do more with um, in places where you have uh, salamanders, in particular there's microsite conditions that are so important um, and, and those need to be maintained. So for riparian, as you can imagine, there's a whole lot of amphibian species that are closely tied to this, as well as garter snakes and turtles. Um, these are critical habitats for these animals um, for their persistence. And there was a recent case study uh, for looking at road mortality in U.S. national parks. And, and this is just, uh, I'm going to use a couple examples of, of road mortality here, mostly because riparian areas often are quite impacted by roads because roads travel along um, rivers and streams in, in the western U.S. so much. Um, and this, this was a, a paper in 2008, but what we see on the top figure here are, are amphibians and reptiles relative to other groups of vertebrates. And this is the number of national park units that were uh, present, that had these animals present within their park unit, and then places where they're actually collecting data on road mortality or habitat fragmentation. As you can see that 23 parks are collecting information on road mortality for amphibians and 26 for reptiles. So that's exciting. That's progress. I think there's some opportunity here. So here's some of the findings from this study for amphibians and reptiles. But if you look at the percentages here for amphibians, the effects of road mortality were considered low for 69% um, of the parks and high for only 5%. Um, if you compare that to what they considered ha fragmenting the habitat, it bumps up a little bit from 60.2% for low and 15% for high. And for reptiles uh, who do a lot of basking on roads, 
Um, you see 55 uh, or 56% for low effects and almost 10% for high effects of road mortality. And then fragmentation again is similar. It bumps up a little bit. So I wanted to give an example from a national park. This one up in Canada, Waterton National Park. And the goal of this was to reduce vehicle mortality along a park entrance road to stem the decline of long-toed salamanders. Um, and this, this came from um, some work in 1994. It was a mark recapture study associated with this pond here, this lake called Lynette Pond. And the um, person found that 10% uh, of the marked salamanders were being killed on this park road. And that, that seemed high. Um, there was a, a follow-up study that, that actually was repeating that, that work and found that the population had been steadily declining. And so there was concern that perhaps this road mortality associated with breeding migrations was um, having significant population effects on the animals that lived in Lynette Lake and then were using um, these areas over here for overwintering. So what they did is they built in, uh, four under road tunnels with drift fences, the dotted line here are drift fences, and then the tunnels are numbered one through four here. And the idea was to benefit long-toed salamanders, but they also had tiger salamanders in the area, western toads and wandering garter snakes. So they thought there could be multiple benefits from these um, tunnels being put into the, to the roadway. And then they uh, did look in 2009 at the effectiveness of these tunnels, and they found that the mortality had dropped down to 0.6% instead of from 10%. Now, is that you know statistically significant? Well, it's hard to say. This is more of a case study, but it did seem like it was having an effect. And more yeah. importantly, they looked at where the animals were using the tunnels. And so these numbers up here are the tunnels, T4 through T1. And then on these numbers down here are the trap numbers. So they put pitfall traps along the, the, the uh, outside here of the road, and they looked at um, some of them very close to the tunnels and some of them further away. And then they looked at when the animals were coming in in the spring to the pond to breed. So this is peak immigration in 2008. And then when they were leaving the pond, peak emigration. And two things to notice here is that there's a lot more animals caught during immigration than emigration. And um, if you look at the distribution in, during the spring, most of them were being caught around this Tunnel 3. And they found that Tunnel 3 was in an area that had higher soil moisture and was a little bit more riparian-like. Um, so that's what they associated that with. In the fall, as animals were leaving, they saw it more spread out. And this is partly, they said, because rains were more common and, and so conditions more favorable. But they also got a lot more animals crossing the road at that time. In 2009, they repeated the study. And you can see here that um, there's been a bit of a shift more to Tunnel 3 and Tunnel 4, so away from these two. Um, and then you, that held up in the emigration as well. So there seems to be something going on here where they're responding to these tunnels um, and, and they seem to be having a, a benefit. Okay, so jumping into uh, permanent wetlands, ponds, and lakes. Under maximizing compatibility, we recommend maintaining the integrity of shoreline areas, reduce the level of fish stocking or avoid fish stocking in, fit, in ponds and lakes. Uh, except in areas where recreational fishing is a primary activity and prohibit the use of non-native bait species. This has become a real problem um, for, uh, particularly if things like uh, salamanders are used as bait species, they can get out, out into the lake and become a non-native species now occupying that ha habitat. Um, for artificial ponds, let the area dry out or drain completely in late fall or early winter. For irrigation, stormwater mitigation, or other water bodies that have specific function other than wildlife habitat, consider whether use by amphibians and reptiles should be discouraged or whether design modifications can be implemented to benefit herpetofauna. And use clean fills, minimize the amount of fill used, and install suitable crossing structures when roads are built in or near permanent ponds or lakes. Under ideal management may involve removing non-native species such as American bullfrogs and non-native fishes retaining uh, or restoring ponds and lakes in a mosaic or cluster because they tend to have higher species diversity and abundance than isolated wetlands, this concept of metapopulations. And for artificial ponds de designed specifically for amphibian habitats, and we're seeing more of these, um, they need to be de designed properly like creating shallow shelf areas allowing for breeding locations. 
As you can imagine, lots of uh, amphibian species utilize these aquatic habitats, but also garter snakes. So the case study, and this, this is out of Yellowstone National Park. There was an effort to remove uh, Yellowstone cutthroat trout, which seems odd to be removing a species with the name, but they, the goal was really to replace those with a native West Slope cutthroat trout. Um, so they thought, well, let's do two things. Let's look at the potential effects of the rotenone treatment itself on amphibians that are living in this system, um, and then also if there's a response to removing this, this non-native fish. And what they did is they um, put 5% rotenone into the lake. Um, they sprayed it along the margins of the lake, which you can see here, and then they also used a, a boat and applied the, the pesticide out into the lake, um, you know, releasing it from a, a boat. And the species they were particularly focused on were Columbia spotter frogs, but this area was also used by boreal toads and um, boreal chorus frogs. This is what they found, that they found that the rotenone caused 100% mortality of tadpoles, but didn't cause any mortality of juvenile or adult Columbia spotted frogs. They also found that the tadpole abundance increased after treatment, um, killed out the Yellowstone cutthroat trout. So what we can see that here, this is our treatment lake, this is before the treatment. Then they removed all of the Yellowstone cutthroat trout, so now the lake is fishless. And this is the number of tadpoles of Columbia spotted frogs the, the year after they did the treatment. And you can see here that the number jumped way up from two, the year before in 2006 simply by removing that predator. But then after 2007, they released this native West Slope cutthroat trout back into the system. And you can see that the numbers of tadpoles is just steadily declining back down because West Slope cutthroat trout are just as effective as a predator as the Yellowstone cutthroat trout. There's really no difference to the frogs probably. And then C are their control lakes. So these are some nearby lakes that they used as their control, and you can see they don't change through time. Okay, our last example here is small streams. And for maximizing compatibility, we recommend consider connectivity of stream and riparian and terrestrial habitats and management plans as these systems are tied together functionally. Review the bigger picture because of the mix of land ownership in many areas. And consider the effects of roadways on streams, focusing management activities on accomplishing desired outcomes for streams. Under an ideal management scenario, we rec recommend potentially removing dams or restoring natural stream flows, including timing and extent of peak flows, maintaining and restoring habitat conditions suitable for stream amphibians, and locate areas with the most abundant or diverse species and consider managing these areas for biodiversity values. Finally, manage riparian zones for biodiversity. And you can see there that there's quite a bit of link between riparian recommendations and streams. Maintain input of large pieces of wood into small streams, sometimes by managing the riparian buffer. Maintain rocky substrates in streams and identify unstable slopes prevent application of fertilizers, pesticides, and fire retardants directly into small streams. And the size of the stream is particularly um, a problem for, for these chemicals because there's not a lot of water to, to dilute. Replace culverts that fail to provide adequate aquatic organism passage, such as perched culverts. So now we're going to um, have Elka give a case study that uh, she worked on, and I'm going to turn it over to her. Thanks, David. Um, just before I switch screens here, oh, oh no, it's okay. Hey, David, while Elka is um, getting ready to take over, would you mind answering a question? Oh, go ahead. Um, it's actually. Um, Mary Kay, are you still on the line? Because I just unmuted you and so you can ask David directly. Sure. Um, my question was, you were talking about buffers around riparian areas um, for a variety of different activities. And do you have any specific guidelines as far as the distance of that buffer, like two times canopy height, or, or anything spe more specific like that that we could use when talking with work groups or putting in contracts for best management practices, that type of thing? We, we tackled some of that in the habitat management guidelines. Um, the problem was it, it was so variable. And 
some of the recommendations for fish um, seem to hold up pretty well. Um, other examples where you have uh, turtles, like western pond turtles, that m need even more um, area around a, a, a water body or stream um, as protected habitat, it makes it a bit difficult to have a set uh, recommendation. But two tree heights, I think, for the most part, is is a good recommendation. Um, but I, it's not a universal rule. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're ready to move on. Go ahead. All right. Sorry, um, um, there's. I'll come. Sorry, there's one more question if um, David can answer it real quick before we move on. It's from Alex Lincoln. Alex, I just unmuted you. Alex, you might have to unmute yourself. Well, let's move on and we can ha answer some more questions at the end, sure. okay? Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have one a uh, case study here for small streams that is in the context of um, a logging operation, but it is applicable to any work in or around small streams like culvert installation or replacement. The goal of the project to, was to reduce the effects of a bridge construction on stream amphibians in order to avoid the company being in violation of the BC Wildlife Act, which states that you cannot knowingly kill, hurt, or harass wildlife in British Columbia, including amphibians and reptiles. So the action that we took was to try and mitigate the impacts um, uh, by doing a salvage operation, and the focal species for this was the coastal-tailed frog. In discussions with the client, um, it became clear that the construction involved building a temporary wooden bridge across a small stream so that they could access um, a block of timber on the other side and an excavator would have to cross the stream at least twice during the work. The bridge was going to be installed in the first year and then removed at the end of the second year. The stream itself was fishless, but it contained a threatened amphibian species that is present year-round. The tadpoles of tilled frogs are in the streams for two to four years before they metamorphose. The main concern that I had from a herb management perspective was that the potential was there for degradation of the habitat, such as um, loss of slope stability, the crushing of or loss of cobbles and boulders, which are important, uh, provide important microsites for tailed frogs, and sedimentation into the stream. And of course, direct mortality of tadpoles and ad uh, adults that might be in the stream during construction. Oops, sorry. There we go. The strategy that we took was focused on three areas. The first was the timing of the work itself. We aim to have the work take place in late summer when stream flows are low, so it makes it easier to capture tilled frogs. And it minimizes uh, the probability that there be a major precipitation event and then associated sedimentation into the stream. The client followed standard provincial practices around sediment and erosion control. And then we conducted an amphibian salvage prior to the onset of construction in both year one and in year two. So a salvage operation entailed um, installing a temporary permeable barrier within the stream. As you can see, our high-tech um, material here, some burlap that was strewn across the stream and um, anchored on the bottom with, with rock. And the a, a barrier, barrier was put up upstream and downstream of the construction zone, so this became what was called our salvage zone. And within that area, we simplified the stream habitat over several passes, which means we walked up and down the stream, uh, removing cobbles and boulders and catching all of the amphibians that we encountered and holding them in temporary buckets. And then we released all of the captured amphibians upstream of the construction zone. We went at least 50 meters upstream. And then we replaced all of the substrate back into the stream. Once the construction was finished in the first year, we removed those semi-permeable barriers so that the um, amphibians could recolonize the area for the winter. And then before the bridge was removed in year two, we basically repeated the whole process again.
The last thing on our list to talk about today is um, regulations regarding amphibians and reptiles. Um, and that last um, case study is a great segue into a brief discussion on regulations. Um, people are often unaware of the fact that they are breaking the law when it comes to herpetofauna. Title 36 of the Federal Code of Regulations, Section 2.2, at the feeding, touching, teasing, frightening, or intentional disturbing of wildlife, nesting, breeding, or other activities is prohibited. And in section 2.4, it states that possessing, carrying, or using a weapon, trap, or net is prohibited. And the definition of a trap in Title 36 is a snare, trap, mesh, wire, or other element, object, or mechanical device designed to entrap or kill animals other than fish. So this would include, um, include any time that we use snake tongs or a snake hook, for example. You would need a permit to do that. Under Section 2.1 of Title 36, it's illegal to possess, destroy, injure, deface, remove, dig, or disturb wildlife or parts thereof from their natural state, whether they are living or dead. Title 36 of the Federal Code of Regulations and under the Lacey Act, it's a violation to collect herps for a photo session, to use a light to find herps at night, or to turn rocks and logs over to look for specimens. When on federal lands, one does not have to cross state lines to meet the interstate commerce stipulation of the Lacey Act. The transportation aspect is met just by moving an organism from one site of capture to your vehicle. In fact, if you collect a herp in violation of any law outside of the park boundaries and then transport that animal into the park, you've committed a Lacey Act violation. In addition, when we are often out there cruising for herps at night, uh, we're probably committing various traffic violations when we're stopping on the road um, and obstructing traffic. So then the big question is, what are you actually allowed to do? Um, if you happen to come across an amphibian or reptile, and, you, and you, uh, you can basically photograph it as long as you don't disturb it in any way. Lastly, we just wanted to show you some of the many field guides and resources that are available to you. Um, as we've mentioned, we have the handout that we've uh, developed, and there's a copy of the Habitat Management Guidelines for Anyone that's interested in receiving one, you can receive a hard copy and or a PDF version of the management guidelines. Um, the handout that we have has some uh, information about the resources that, that are available at the park website. It has a summary of the regulations that I just went over. Uh, and it also has some links to resources that were specific to the topics that the National Park staff sent to us. So hopefully that will provide some answers for you on the things that we weren't able to address during this webinar. Um, I think Jen has given her email address a couple times, and she could probably do it at least one more time um, to guide you on how to obtain a copy of that hard, um, that hard copy handout and the PDF for, or the hard copy HMG. Lastly, here's our contact information. If um, anybody wants to talk to David or I um, and ask any questions, um, after the webinar. Thanks, Elka. And I wanted to let folks know that I posted the uh, link to the PDF version of the Habitat Management Guidelines that we talked about today. If you'd like to get a hard copy of them, uh, we can send one out as well. Just let uh, me know, and and I'll put one in the mail right away. I can, if you want multiple copies to uh, hand out to other staff members, we can provide that as well. Sounds good. Thanks, Elka and David. And um, I just wanted to make sure we got in this last question here. Um, that other question I was trying to figure out earlier was just about the um, handout. But this new question says, I'm curious about the language related to perched culverts. My understanding is that amphibians will choose near stream habitat for movement versus moving through a dark, unnatural surface, such as a culvert for passage. Um, Elka or David, can one of you field that question? Go ahead, David. Sure. So the the work that's been done on uh, culverts, there there is some species that don't seem to want to move through culverts. E um, definitely, the ones that are metal bottomed seem to be less desirable. But 
the new type of culvert that's more half round with a natural substrate on the bottom, um, which is what you're finding in like tunnel, like, you know, crossing tunnels and things like that. Um, those are used quite readily by animals. They don't seem to distinguish it. Um, they also tend to have a little bit more light in them. So I think the answer to the question is yes and no, depending on what type of culvert we're talking about. But the traditional perched culvert are particularly problematic also because animals can't get into them. They're perched. Sure, and um, we do have one other question, but I don't know that you two would be able to answer it. I'm, I'm going to jot it down and ask um, my law enforcement contact. But the question is, is an NPS research permit enough if the species is not federally listed? How do you obtain permits to allow such trapping in addition to NPS uh, research permit? And you don't know the answers to that, do you, um, Elka or David? No. No. Okay. okay. Well, if there are no further questions, I'll just run down here real quick again. Yeah, I don't see any others. So. Um, Say. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today, and especially to David and Elka, of course, for taking their time to share their expertise on amphibian and reptile conservation and management. Um, again, this webinar will be recorded, so if you'd like to go back to it later or share the information with one of your colleagues, that would be great. Um, and again, we'll be announcing future uh, webinars. We have Midwest coming up in April, and then we have uh, Northeast and Southeast coming up after that. So stay tuned for some more webinars, and thanks again for tuning in. We really appreciate your time.